have working theory in Barry and Honey Sherman murders. For those of you who do not know the details of this case, a full summary is pasted below this update. A quick, too long, didn't read. Billionaire and his wife were found murdered in their homes on December 15, 2017. After initially classifying it as a murder slash suicide, police later reclassified it as a murder after the family hired a private investigator. Very little information has come out since, but the two main theories here seem to be family resentments over finances, his cousin, Carrie Winter, seems particularly unhinged during interviews, although I don't think he's involved, and a corporate hit due to Sherman's practice of undercutting major pharmaceutical companies with generic alternatives. This update isn't very earth-shattering, but it's the biggest development yet given the lack of information provided by police thus far. A lead investigator stated last week that police have an idea of what happened, and the journalist who broke the story claims at least one witness is refusing to speak to the police. After people that investigators would like to speak to cannot be located, and the police believe these folks may have fled the country. In another article, which has since been pay blocked, so I didn't post a link, any star subscribers out there? It is stated that the police should finally be getting access to electronic records this week, which may prove helpful in the investigation. I don't know how excited to get about this, as the investigator's words sound very carefully chosen. An idea of what happened is a far cry from a trail of evidence leading to a suspect. Obviously, this doesn't help us in speculating who might be responsible, but I, at least, have hope that substantial developments will be revealed in the near future. Summary from Wikipedia. Bernard Charles Barry Sherman, born February 25, 1942, died December 15, 2017, was a Canadian businessman and philanthropist who was chairman and CEO of Apotex Incorporated. With an estimated net worth of uh, 3.2 billion US dollars at the time of his death, according to Forbes, Sherman was the 12th wealthiest Canadian. Another publication, Canadian Business, stated his fortune at 4.77 billion Canadian dollars, ranking him the 15th richest in Canada. Sherman and his wife were murdered in their home by unknown assailants, according to Toronto police, who are still investigating the case. Early life and education. Sherman was born into a Jewish family in Toronto to Herbert Dick Hyman Sherman, a business partner for a zipper company, and Sarah Sarah Sherman, uh, née Winter, an occupational therapist after her husband's death. His grandparents from both sides had fled persecution of Jews in Russia and Poland. His father died from heart attack when Bernard was still young at the age of 10. He won a national physics contest while attending the Forest Hill Collegiate Institute and graduated with top marks. He entered the University of Toronto's engineering science program at age 16, believed to be the youngest to do so. The same year, he signed up for a Canadian Army organized student militia. He graduated with the highest honors in his class and received the university's Governor General's Award for his thesis. In 1967, he completed a PhD in astrophysics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. During high school and while at the University of Toronto, Sherman often worked for his uncle, Louis Lloyd Winter, at his Empire Laboratories, then Canada's largest wholly owned pharmaceutical company. When his uncle would travel, Sherman often helped watch over the operations. Career. In 1967, after completing his PhD, Sherman purchased the Empire Group of Companies from the executor of the estate of his aunt and uncle, Beverly and Louis Lloyd Winter, as both had died 17 days apart in November 1965, leaving four orphaned young children, Paul Timothy, Jeffrey Andrew, Carrie Joel Dexter, and Dana Charles. Prior to the purchase, Empire was the first to secure the compulsory rights to manufacture Hoffman LaRoche's Valium, diazepam, and was one of Canada's largest manufacturers of Pfizer's Vibromycin, doxycycline, Upjohn Company's Oranase, Tolbutamide, and the dietary sweetener Saccharin. To facilitate the corporate acquisition, Sherman, along with his high school friend Joel Uster, Sherman and Ulster Limited, offered 5% equity options to each of the four children and a 15-year royalty on four of its patented products. 
In 1970, he invested in New York's Barr Laboratories with U.S.-based partners, became its largest shareholder, and served as Barr's president. As of 2000, he controlled about 33% of Barr Laboratories stock. Barr won the first rights to manufacture generic versions of Eli Lilly's Prozac. Today, Barr Laboratories is a part of the Teva Pharmaceutical Industries, the world's largest generic drug maker, following Teva's acquisition of Barr Pharmaceuticals in 2008. In January 1972, Sherman and Ulster Limited sold Empire Laboratories to the Quebec-based Canadian operations of publicly traded international chemical and nuclear of California for 57,000 shares of Valiant Pharmaceuticals. In 1973, Sherman stated Apotex with a few former Empire Laboratories personnel and he incorporated it in 1974. This privately owned and Sherman controlled company claims to be Canada's largest Canadian owned pharmaceutical manufacturer. Sherman also became involved in nutraceutical manufacturing and other businesses, founding NION, the National Institute of Nutrition, with Richard Kaschenberg. He later sold the company to Schiff and continued on to Apotex. By 2016, Apotex employed over 10,000 people as one of Canada's largest drug manufacturers, with over 260 products selling in over 115 countries. Revenues were about $1.5 billion annually. Personal life. Sherman married Honey Reich in 1971, a fellow University of Toronto graduate born in 1948 in Austria to Polish Holocaust survivors. They had four children, a son, Jonathan, and three daughters, Lauren, Alexandra, and Kaylin. Sherman, with his wife, donated a record $50 million to the United Jewish Appeal. They provided funds to build a major addition to the Geriatric Baycrest Center and to other Toronto area community centers in Ontario. The couple were also major donors to the United Way. As well, the Apotex Foundation had sent over $50 million worth of medicine to disaster zones since 2007. Reputation and personality. Sherman had a mixed reputation, or what the National Post called two legacies. Toronto Mayor John Tory said Barry and Honey were kind, good people, and Sherman was widely praised for his philanthropic giving. Sherman was called a deplorable human being in reference to his business practices by University of Ottawa law professor Amir Adarin, who claimed that he gouged Canadians with high drug prices. Canadians pay more for generic drugs than almost every other country. He sought to manipulate our system to enrich himself and impoverish Canadian patients who used his drugs, he said. He accused Sherman of crossing intellectual property right ethical lines to fight as many as a hundred battles at a time in court to challenge drug patents and make a way for Apotex's generic prescriptions with little end benefit to consumers. As told in Jeffrey Robinson's 2001 book, Prescription Games, Money, Ego, and Power Inside the Pharmaceutical Industry, Sherman himself acknowledged the long-running conflict between Apotex and the major pharmaceutical companies over drug patents, saying, the branded drug companies hate us. They have private investigators on us all the time. The thought once came to my mind, why didn't they just hire someone to knock me off? In 2011, the Winter Children, his cousins, sued Sherman, alleging he never paid royalties and equity in Apotex, contending Sherman had used the proceeds from the 1972 sale of their late father's business, Empire, to buy Apotex in 1973. The cousins sought a 20% interest in Apotex, or damages of $1 billion. Sherman responded by withdrawing millions of dollars in financial assistance to his cousins. The cousins contended that Sherman had, quote, had offered the financial assistance in the first place in order to make the cousins dependent on him and to keep them from learning about their rights to the business, though this was denied by Sherman. In September 2017, an Ontario Superior Court justice ruled against the cousins, saying the case was wishful thinking and beyond fanciful. At the time of the judgment, a lawyer for the cousins said they would appeal, though no appeal occurred, and Sherman died a few months later under unknown circumstances. At the time of his death, Sherman was under investigation because of a fundraiser he had held for Justin Trudeau in April 2015, allegedly contrary to Canada's lobbying rules. Sherman filed a lawsuit in May 2016, attempting to quash the investigation. 
There is basis to conclude that Mr. Sherman is in breach of the lobbyist code of conduct as a consequence of his involvement in the organization of a fundraising event for the Liberal Party, according to Phil McIntosh, Director of Investigations at the Office of the Lobby Commissioner. If that had been proven, Sherman would have been banned from lobbying for five years. A partial draft of his unpublished memoir called Legacy of Thoughts was submitted as part of Sherman's motion for summary judgment in a lawsuit brought by his orphaned cousins. He described the manuscript as his observations on philosophy, Canadian politics, and the pharmaceutical industry. Sherman did not believe in God, free will, altruism, or morality. I find no inconsistency in holding intellectually that life has no meaning, while at the same time being highly motivated to survive and to achieve, he once said. Barry Sherman was targeted by the Canadian wing of the Jewish Defense League, a group on the FBI's terrorists list, and had been sued by Israel's largest generic drug maker, Teva. Death. On December 15, 2017, police officers were called to Sherman's home at 50 Old Colony Road in North York, Toronto, by the couple's real estate agent, where they discovered the bodies of Sherman and his wife hanging side by side next to their indoor pool. The deaths are being investigated as suspicious, and the Toronto Police Service Homicide Squad has taken the lead in the investigation, because this unit is the most experienced in dealing with sudden, unexpected deaths. Post-mortem examinations showed the cause of both deaths was ligature neck compression, which is ligature strangulation caused by binding or tying. Ligature strangulation is usually distinguished from hanging by the strangling force being something other than the person's own body weight. Toronto Police Service had previously told the news media that there was no indication of forced entry into the Sherman home and that their investigation does not include a search for any suspects. Although there was no note left by the deceased, police sources told the Toronto Star on December 15th or 16th, 2017, that they were probing the possibility that there was a murder-suicide. In response, the couple's four children issued a statement urging the police to conduct a thorough criminal investigation and chastised the police for leaking a murder-suicide theory. They also contacted Toronto lawyer Brian Greenspan to retain a private investigator to look into the deaths. He hired Tom Klett, a retired Toronto police detective who has worked in the Homicide, Drug, and Intelligence Bureaus. The family also hired Dr. David Chiasson, the retired chief forensic pathologist for Ontario, to conduct another autopsy. On January 20th, 2018, the Toronto Star published an exclusive report based on anonymous sources from the family's investigation team who said that the deaths were murders. The couple was strangled by belts after their hands were tied. These investigators had not yet gained access to the Sherman home. People, for, people providing information for this story are not identified as they were not authorized to discuss the case, according to the Star. When contacted by a reporter, a Toronto police spokesman reiterated the position that they were treating the deaths as suspicious. On January 26th, Toronto police advised the news media that their investigation concluded that the couple had been murdered in a targeted attack. At the time, they would not discuss any possible suspects, but planned to interview everyone who had access to the home prior to the deaths via the lockbox that was previously installed by the real estate agent. The police investigation has encountered resistance at Apotex headquarters, with a police spokesman saying legal complexities in some executions have been challenging given the litigious nature of Barry Sherman's businesses, in particular the search and seizure of electronics in Barry Sherman's workspace at Apotex. The police investigation was still continuing in September 2018 when the detectives obtained seven search warrants in addition to the 21 previously obtained. Detective Dennis Yim told the court that investigators are methodically reviewing material and pursuing different investigative avenues. In late October 2018, lawyer Brian Greenspan announced that the family had offered a $10 million reward in the couple's murder investigation for any information that leads to the arrest and prosecution of a suspect. At the same time, he complained about the police investigation, claiming that it had failed to collect important evidence. Police Chief Mark Saunders later told the news media that a forensic pathologist has been working on the case, in addition to over 50 officers, interviewing 200 witnesses and collecting over 2,000 hours of video surveillance from neighboring homes. 
When asked if police would be willing to work with the independent experts to be convened by Greenspan, Saunders replied in the positive, but only if the group would be accepted in a court proceeding. By October 2018, police had obtained 37 warrants related to the investigation. Comments If law enforcement believes people that are involved cannot be located because they have likely fled the country, this seems to point to a hitman being used. The more people that are involved, the more likely one of them will roll and tell law enforcement what happened to save their own skin. It makes sense that some family members may not be granting interviews to law enforcement. I'm sure they have very competent lawyers that are advising against it. It doesn't necessarily point to their guilt. Access to money means access to top-tier legal representation. I don't doubt the family immediately contacted attorneys and are following their advice. A reply from OP. A professional hit seems very likely, as the perp was able to trick investigators into thinking it was a suicide, and Sherman's prominent place in society is far more likely to attract someone willing to pay a high premium for such work. Plus, this wasn't your typical shoot-and-run break-in. Somebody wanted these people to die in fear. I'm with you on the family lawyering up and not talking to police. They were involved in bitter litigation against Sherman for years, and their suit was tossed by a judge a couple of months before the murder. That is quite clearly a giant red flag, and I wouldn't be in a hurry to talk to Toronto police anyway, given their horrid reputation and mishandling of the case from the get-go. I still lean towards someone in his personal life, as a corporate hit just sounds so fantastical. But you don't make billions of dollars without collecting some enemies along the way. It's easy to see why narrowing down a suspect pool would be so difficult. Next comment. I feel like the police really screwed up in this case in the beginning. I remember when the murders first broke and the police kept insisting it was a murder-suicide pact. It wasn't until the children hired a PI that they changed their tune. I would not be surprised at all if it was a hit. Powerful people have powerful enemies. A reply from OP. The police definitely botched this, which is strange to me given what an unconventional murder victim the Shermans are. You would think they would have crossed every T and dotted every I before making a murder-suicide claim. It's sad to think how much potentially incriminating evidence got away in those first few weeks. My theory is neither corporate intrigue nor the family. The former is just too conspiracy theorish, and the latter based on nothing but a nut job carries blathering. He couldn't pull this off in a million years. And all the evidence indicates the kids love their parents. No, this was a personal and business relationship that went awry. Barry invested a lot of money, a lot in the eyes of us normal folk, in side businesses. These were usually endeavors started by friends or people who came to him with ideas beer companies, yachts, etc. To him, it was chump change, but he did expect to get paid back. He was a cheapskate and a very hard worker. I can see him being a bastard to someone who, whose company tanked, especially if he deemed their business acumen to be poor. Someone killed Barry and Honey with hatred and vengeance and enjoyed watching them beg. Taking them down to the pool and finding belts and making them kneel in that humiliating way is not Mossad. It's personal. Next comment. Very personal. A hitman wouldn't do the whole taking them down to the pool and making them kneel thing either. I agree. The hit would have been done in a more impersonal way, whereby the actual killer isn't carrying around those feelings of anger that we see in these murders. It would be more clinical, in my opinion. And isn't strangling one of the most up-close and personal ways of homicide? It also takes longer than, say, shooting or stabbing. I'm still shocked the family is going to demolish the home. I wouldn't want it sitting vacant forever, but it seems like if there's a chance that there was some evidence missed, it's all going to be plowed under. Next comment. I'm curious how the perpetrators got around the security measures, and has anything been said about that? One would expect that billionaires would have bodyguards in addition to high-tech surveillance systems, not to mention the presence of house staff, which could be potential witnesses. Seems way too high risk, and a lot of planning must have gone into it, which tells me there must have been some kind of inside knowledge. I wonder if they recruited someone who worked for them to give them intel on their habits or schedule. <coughs> Next comment. It's funny to me that police say they are looking into who last had access to the home via the lockbox, when a professional could get into one of those key lockboxes without much difficulty. My husband is a locksmith, and there are YouTube videos of locksmiths getting into them.
Corporate intrigue as a motive seems very unlikely. Such murders are extremely rare because the people who would be at a level to make such a decision are generally very wealthy and would be unlikely to take such a risk. If, for some reason, someone felt sufficiently motivated, it is unclear that Barry was still involved in the business in a way that his death would disrupt a significant action. If someone within his company, with a rival company, or anyone who had any business dealings that would benefit from Barry's demise, you would expect a hitman to perform a clean hit. Nothing fancy, just make sure Barry is dead. The contractee isn't implicated and the contractor isn't caught. There would be no reason to involve Honey and absolutely no reason to do any staging that would take time and increase the chances of leaving evidence. If this was a contract hit, someone was willing to pay a lot more to include Honey and stage it in a way that would either embarrass the victims and their family or make some kind of statement. There were family members who had a clear motive to kill the Shermans, but I'm not so sure they were capable of pulling this sort of thing off, and we can assume that they have been heavily investigated. Barry did associate with some characters, who may have had the criminal smarts and contacts to pull it off. If any of them had a motive, it hasn't come out yet. Then again, I haven't completely rejected the possibility of it really being a murder-suicide all along. The family may have had the power to influence the investigation. The somewhat cryptic information recently released says little more than, we are on the ball and have been making progress, but don't be disappointed if the case is never solved. Reply from OP. I agree with you for all the reasons listed. I'm willing to believe that some angry business associate could have arranged this on his or her own, but the idea that big pharma execs are planning executions in the boardroom makes no sense to me. And you're right, there are far easier ways to kill somebody if you're just looking to eliminate a business rival. Absolutely no need to take the risk associated with breaking into someone's home and murdering the occupants in a slow, risky, labor-intensive manner. The family is a much more promising avenue for me, as it only takes one bitter and entitled person to set the events in motion and seek out a pro, but God only knows how many people this guy might have pissed off over the years. They're just a handful of what I assume must be hundreds slash thousands of people who have had close personal or financial ties with Sherman over the years. Or hell, maybe Honey was the target. I find this unlikely, but given that we've had a big fat zero so far, it's... So I have no experience with this case or with these companies, but I previously worked as a chemist at a pharmaceutical company, and to me, this logic makes no sense at all. Pharmaceutical companies know the second their product is off patent, the profits are gone. Generics popping up are planned for and expected 17 years in advance. Everything about the R&D cycles to the marketing is based around a limited window for real profit. There's generally no ill will towards the generic manufacturers. Many companies similarly also manufacture generics in addition to the proprietary discoveries still under patent. By the point the generics come along, the research pipeline is 10 plus years ahead of the game and it's old news. Not that it absolutely couldn't be something related to his business, but it strikes me that it's more likely to be a personal vendetta rather than revenge for making generics that the competition already assumed would be made by possibly several generics manufacturers. Next comment. My dad has been a senior manager for Apotex for over 15 years and worked with Barry in the same building. I wouldn't rule out a hit that relates back to Tiva via personal connection. So Jeremy Desai was pretty much the executive who ran day-to-day -day operations in Apotex. He actually had a relationship with one of the executives at Tiva and persuaded her to leak confidential documents. A tip made by a Tiva employee led to an investigation, which led to a massive lawsuit against Apotex, Jeremy, and the Tiva exec, greenlighted after Barry was murdered. Within the Apotex rumor mill, it was said that Barry had schemed this opportunity to extract rival company secrets with Jeremy. The two were very close, and it worked. Jeremy leaked secret documents during board meetings which led to Apotex edging Tiva for a while in the R&D sectors of their respective companies. Haven't really dug into the time period of the leaked secrets of if Apotex's profits were drastically larger than Tiva's. Basically, Berender Sandhu, a Tiva exec, and Jeremy's career were over. Also, to add, they actually did have a real relationship which came crashing down after they were caught by Tiva. The murders happened soon after Tiva learned of the relationship. 
According to the employee rumors, and mostly from other execs, I wouldn't be surprised if Tiva found out that Barry orchestrated everything in order to hit, or even if Jeremy and Brenda were the ones behind it, as they were ousted from their careers, yet Barry was not and could have continued to run Apotex. If it was Barry's idea this entire time, maybe the two parties who were most impacted turned against him and didn't have much left to lose at this point. With how rich and powerful they were together, finding a pro for the job, I'm sure, would be easier than one would think. The guy drove a beater car from the 90s and would get pissed at the vending machine when it wouldn't dispense the chocolate. Even Barry's own children don't like him. He was even sued by his own cousin. The guy was really greedy. I'm sure that became his downfall. I remember being so caught up in this case because my dad was really impacted by all of this. Massive chaos within the company structure. And after reading all the reports and theories and taking into account the stories my dad would tell me about Barry, I'm sure he got himself into some deep shit. By the way, I have tons of theories, but the two mentioned are my favorites. Next comment. I'm still skeptical of Barry's cousin and his behavior. I can't say why or even if he's completely involved. I do not take the fact that he failed the polygraph to mean anything. The motive just seems so personal in my opinion. Truthfully, I go back and forth on his involvement. If, in the end, he is somehow involved in the professional hit theory or any others that exist, I wouldn't be shocked. At the same time, I wouldn't be shocked if he were completely innocent either. Hell, maybe he's just an odd guy who often puts his foot in his mouth. Moreover, he doesn't seem organized enough to put together any type of plan for murders like these. Sometimes I think he just knows more than what he said, perhaps about the family. What? I don't know. Next comment. A week ago, the Toronto Star reported that Barry Sherman was planning to make a substantial donation to charity and also give Honey between 100 and 500 million to do whatever she wanted with it. The plans did not get carried out because the murders happened. Maybe the murders were committed to stop the money being given away. The same article also discusses the family's repeated legal actions to stop the will being released to the public. Supposedly, the will contains the names of the children, spouses, and grandchildren. According to today's article, Barry Sherman's will left everything to Honey Sherman if she survived him, and if she predeceased him, the estate was to be shared equally among the Sherman children. Even more suspicious, Honey's will cannot be found. Just thinking about the deaths is highly suspicious and shines the spotlight on the beneficiaries of Barry Sherman's estate. They had the motivation, the reason to commit murder, and they could have hired killers to do the job. Whoever wrote this article appears to have it in for the Sherman children. However, there is another angle that hasn't gotten much attention. The old Colony Road house was listed for sale about three weeks before the murders. The house was listed for $6.9 million, and the listing agent raved about the house's construction and features. What's interesting about this is that the Shermans had sued the designers and builders of the house for poor construction and recouped $2 million of the $2.3 million cost. As you can imagine, these parties took a major financial hit because of the Shermans and most likely are still bitter about it. One newspaper article mentioned that most of the acrimony about the old Colony Road home was related to the indoor pool. A lot of people online have said the staging of the murders in the pool area may have some special significance and that figuring out the significance would lead to solving the murders. But let's not forget one key piece of the puzzle. On December 12, 2017, the day before the murders, Honey Sherman missed a meeting at Baycrest without giving any notice to the organizers. This was so out of character for Honey that Baycrest sent her an email to check that she was okay, and she immediately responded saying that she was dealing with some issues. To many people, this suggests that Honey was dealing with personal, most likely family issues. A reply from OP says, this is seeming more and more like a family matter, but I'm trying to withhold judgment. The emails between Barry and Son do not paint a good picture for Jonathan, but at the same time, I wonder what Barry's emails with other business partners might look like. I might be just as skeptical of, say, D'Angelo had the Son released emails between those two. Right now, though, Jonathan seems on the surface to be a good candidate. Motive, opportunity, familiarity with the scene, 
plus a general air of being an entitled rich kid with no real clue of what he's doing. Barry made an excellent point when he said that his lifetime of decisions, some of which Jonathan strongly disagreed with, would likely make his son a billionaire, and no real plans for the future. I have a feeling a big break could be coming shortly. I will not be surprised at all if Jonathan ends up in handcuffs. Thanks for the update. This is a fascinating case. Next comment. Did the police actually believe it was a murder-suicide and close slash botch the investigation because of that assumption? Or did they just say that to the public? I always see the former commented upon, but I assume the latter is the case to keep the investigation slash details quiet. It's such a bizarre setup that I have no idea, especially as it involves two of them. Like, it is either a statement or a stage scene. It could be a murder-suicide, if for some reason they wanted it to be a performance, whether to make a dramatic exit, make a statement to someone, or implicate someone. There might not be much evidence in that case, because it would have been a mutual plan, an idea that may have not had much obvious external cause. Not quite folly à deux, but along those lines. If it was a murder, it still looks like a statement or staged. If it is a business slash political in motivation, it would be done to make a statement. That is generally unlikely, but if they were symbolic of some powerful interest or the betrayal of it, in which it was necessary to make a statement, it is a possibility. By this, I don't mean competitive corporate stuff. As others may have pointed out, one guy is unlikely to make a big difference here, and this high-stakes stuff is normal. The crime is not. But he seems to have been a pretty big player, being a billionaire, and it is possible he got into some sort of intrigue the normal rich businessman does not. He seems to have been a person who was pretty fearless and adventurous, seeking out challenges. People like that don't settle down when they become billionaires. There is no end point. They will always get bored. He could have gotten into some sort of legal or quasi-legal drug trafficking on a large scale or threatened to blow the whistle on it. That would be far more dangerous than hurting competitors through generics. Anyone could resume where he left off. It could be a statement against whistleblowers or cheaters. Killing his wife is pretty drastic, though. She could have been involved somehow. Weird crimes like this are usually personal. Even a hit job to make a statement usually would not be so elaborate. Whether a family member, an angry business partner or client, or anyone else, this is weird. It could be that they attempted to stage it to look like something else after the fact and weren't super brilliant. Personal rage doesn't lend itself to meticulous planning. It seems like something the average person might dream up as a staged scene. It seems like a really odd way to kill someone if done solely out of anger slash bitterness. But such an emotional outburst also makes it more likely that both would be killed, especially if it was a family member. There is always the option that their prominence caught the attention of someone very disturbed who wanted to do this as a performance slash statement to the world and or to himself or herself. This happens, but is rare. In any event, I don't think this was done for show. Maybe not the deaths themselves, but the presentation. I don't think that making lots of enemies is as significant as it sounds for this reason. Most enemies don't do things like this. It's less about the number of them than the specific type. I realize that having more enemies generally means better chances of every type, but not necessarily. And now my two cents. These are my own comments on this case. Um, this case is really fascinating to me. Um, first, I'll go through the murder-suicide theory. This one is the easiest to discount. The bodies were kneeling. If Honey were a murder victim, she could have easily just stood up and saved herself. So I don't think that this was a murder-suicide. Um, it takes a lot of commitment for someone to hang themselves from a low railing. Almost nobody could pull this off. And the evidence on their autopsies showed that they were strangled by ligatures, not by hanging. Barry's glasses on his face were not even disturbed. Who can hang themselves and not even knock their glasses off kilter a little bit? If Barry strangled Honey and then hung her up, why? she'd already be dead and he's about to kill himself. Barry was old, so this would have been difficult as well. There was no reason for him to hang her up. He could have just left her on the ground after he strangled her. 
Barry didn't die of hanging, but from ligature strangulation. So how did he strangle himself and then hang himself up? It's just not possible. So I think that the murder-suicide theory is a bit ridiculous. I don't think it's possible, and I think that that is not what happened. Similarly, there's the theory of the suicide pact, that the, that the Shermans had agreed together to kill themselves and that they chose to hang themselves. And a lot of the arguments that I made for the murder-suicide theory being bunk are the same ones that I'll apply here. Um, it's really hard to strangle yourself when you're kneeling on the ground. Both of them would have had to be been very committed to choking themselves and then somehow instead of making it look like a hanging in the autopsy make it look like instead that they were strangled by ligatures that's that's a pretty weird thing for it to happen there's evidence their arms were tied so how would that get there if they were committing suicide and then who removed it afterwards and took it um, if they were going to hang themselves, I'm sure in this massive house they could find tons of places they could hang themselves from that wasn't a low railing that would be a slow, agonizing, difficult, and probably unsuccessful death. The Shermans had made a lot of plans for the very near future, for the coming days um, after their death. And in fact, some of them were pretty big plans, like plans... Barry had plans to give a large amount of money to Honey for her to do whatever she wanted with, and they both had decided to give a large amount of money to charity. So they didn't complete those plans, and they also had other plans. They were moving, selling their house, doing all kinds of things. So I don't think that someone who intended to commit suicide would go through all of this. They would just walk away from it, I think. The next theory that some people think is what happened is the corporate hitman theory. And that's the theory that uh, some of the big pharma executives hired a hitman to take Barry out. I think this is not what happened. If this was a hit, it was the worst hitman ever. I think big pharma is wealthy enough to hire a hitman who knows what they're doing. And I don't think it would have looked like a... Uh, mess the way that it has been. It's triggered an investigation. There's all kinds of evidence. And what kind of hitman makes it look like they were hung? I don't think so. The hitman would have come and shot them or stabbed them, just done it and left. And they wouldn't have had all these signs of emotional involvement in the killing. Apotex had 10,000 employees. That's a fairly large company. So these other big pharma execs would well know that you could take the founder out and kill him. You can kill his wife too, but that's not going to make their problem go away. Apotex is here to stay. They have 10,000 people running it. And Barry, of course, he led them to be very successful, but I'm certain that the company could run without him. And in fact, I believe it has. I believe it still is running today. So I think executives would know this. Um, I also think that Barry's company was not a very big problem for them. They understood that lots of other companies made generics and they expected it to happen. And in fact, other companies make generics too. So it's kind of a practice that goes on. I don't think that Barry's uh, spy mission that he sent his employee on to shack up with a Tiva executive and get Tiva secrets and documents. I, I think that was uh, pretty sketchy. And I'm sure Tiva was not happy when they found out about that. But I don't think that murdering him at this point would do anything for Tiva. So I don't think that Tiva had anything to do with it. I think if it was business related, then why did they kill Honey? What was the point? There was no reason to kill her. She wasn't involved in running the business. So it was strange for them to come and kill both of them. Uh, the next theory, which I think is actually a possibility, is uh, that they were killed for revenge for the lawsuit that they filed against the builders of their home. The Shermans 
recoup $2 million of the $2.3 million total cost of building their home. And they did that through suing the builders, alleging that their workmanship was really terrible. So basically they got a $2.3 million home for only $300,000. So this theory would only make sense if the $2 million loss was a complete devastation to the builders or that the builder's management had some really unhinged nutcase people in it. I just am inclined to believe that any builder who is qualified to build a $2.3 million home is probably a very successful builder. They could probably take a two point million, uh, I think they could take a $2 million hit and still stay in business, although it wouldn't be pleasant. So I don't think that the builders would have any reason to kill them uh, unless they have some kind of serial killer, really unhinged person who's the owner of the building company uh, or the main manager. I just don't think this is very likely. It would have come out by now. This person uh, and their tendencies, if they existed, would have been uh, no secret because somebody like that cannot control themselves everybody is going to start to notice through their lives and come forward when they realize that this person had reason to commit murder. And nobody has done that. Nobody has said that, that anyone in the builder's organization may have had anything to do with it. Another theory that I think is a possibility is that the killings were revenge for sour business deals. Barry made all these different random business deals on the side that weren't related to Apotex. And from the sounds of it, a lot of it sounded like it was total speculation and he understood that. Uh, some of them were like Hollywood movies that he was investing in, uh, yachts, uh, beer companies. These are all very unusual businesses and I have a hard time believing that he had a lot of experience in and the knowledge of these businesses for him to really consider this a serious investment. I think what really happened was that he wanted to help somebody out or he was willing to lose the money and take a risk, take a gamble, and he would fund these different business partners and just see how far they got. And maybe he didn't really have a large expectation that the business would succeed. So I don't know if this is a really legit theory, although there is evidence that if he loaned you money or loaned anyone business money that he did make sure he got paid back so maybe when he pressed to get paid back someone got really angry about that um, I would imagine that some, some kind of argument or fight like this would have been noticed by somebody but nobody has come forward with any accusations um, another theory is that Barry and Honey were killed by Mossad and I'm like what no no, they weren't. Okay. This is ridiculous. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know where someone pulled that from. Just because they're Jewish doesn't mean that they're, you know, dealing with the intelligence agencies in Israel. So we can just toss that out the window. There's just no way. Another theory is that their cousin killed them. I think this is possible, but personally, I have some doubt about this. Carrie Winter, their cousin, bitterly hated the Shermans. He hated both of them. He failed a polygraph test, which could mean nothing. Uh, many believe that Winter isn't capable of being organized enough to kill people in this manner, but I don't think we should underestimate him. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to strangle someone. I think with his bitterness and his hatred towards the Shermans, it's totally possible, but for some reason, I've seen him talk and I think he just hates them and is glad they're dead, but I don't think that he killed them. And I have no real reason for that. Just other than looking at his face and looking at him explain, I just don't think he did it. Which I think is the most likely is that one or more of their children killed them. I think that there's a lot of evidence that Jonathan was bitterly opposed to Barry's plan to give a large donation to charity and then give a large amount of money to his wife, Honey. His emails with his father show that he saw his father's money as his money. 
and he didn't like the idea of someone giving it away. Obviously, this is kind of ridiculous because my first knee-jerk reaction was if someone thought, even if they were my child, if someone thought that their money was my money, uh, I would have a real issue with that. But the way that Barry spoke to his son was not as strong as I think most people would have talked to someone saying those kind of things. I feel like <clears throat> he was more than fair and more than kind. Um, he didn't squelch the or s stomp on that whole idea that the money would eventually be his son's money. Um, but the son definitely had the impression that this was his cash and he didn't want it given away. Uh, the thing that really made me wonder about the son, Jonathan, was viewing footage of the funeral. At the funeral, Jonathan gave a eulogy where he barely mentioned his parents. And I know that may mean nothing, but it strikes me as strange or odd. But what really got me was it just seemed like he was damn near beaming. Just like his eyes were smiling and he just couldn't hide the fact that he was delighted. I guess it's possible that maybe he was starstruck a little bit because a lot of really important people turned out for this funeral, like Justin Trudeau. And maybe he was just very starstruck and excited. It sounds like the eulogy that he wrote catered to people like Justin Trudeau and the mayor who showed up at the funeral because his eulogy was basically a speech about what it means to be a great Canadian. I think the, to the way that he was acting, I can't justify that in my mind. I know everybody makes the argument that, oh, well, people, people uh, grieve differently and la, 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 la. I'm like, no, you need to look at Barry and Honey's sister who was on stage bawling her eyes out and couldn't keep it together. That woman is grieving. You need to look at maybe some of the girl, the female children who were on stage with Jonathan. And you can tell that they were not reacting like their aunt did, but I could see how they were grieving. It looked like uh, maybe stunned or shocked or maybe even drugged uh, that they just were not handling it the same way, but it was in a way that made sense to me. The way that Jonathan was acting didn't make sense at all. He was happy. Uh, in my mind, it just really looks like he was happy that they were gone and delighted at what that meant for him. I also think he had, a re he had total access to their schedules and information. He would be able to go to their house and easily access it. They would not fight him if he wanted to come in. And so no forced entry is no problem with this theory. Um, also, Honey's will went missing. Only a limited number of people would have had access to her will, and then only a limited number of people would have had reason to get rid of that will. And I think it's possible that their descendants could have had some reason to do that, and they had access to it, I'm sure. The children also have announced since the murder that they plan to demolish this $6.9 million house that their parents were killed in. I understand $6.9 million is probably nothing to them. They probably don't even care about the money. But if it were me, I would not be tearing down a house so fast if it had a chance of helping solve the murder of my parents, that there might be some evidence that's left in the house, something that people could look at in the future in order to close this case and find who killed my parents. That's how I would react. I have a hard time seeing how someone would want to demolish this until after the whole case was closed. Then I could see how if $7 million is nothing to them, that they're like, okay, we just want this house gone off the face of this earth. I can see that. Okay. What bothers me is they're doing it before all the evidence may have been collected. Now, some people might say the fact that they hired a private investigator and they offered a $10 million reward doesn't this show that they were innocent, that they want to find their, their parents' killer? I think that is not exactly true. 
I think the fact that the private investigator was pushing for access to the police investigation case files, I think that that is a good enough reason to hire a private investigator to get inside intel on what exactly the police know and what exactly they're doing. If you're the perpetrator, that is really useful information to know. Hell, if you're not the perpetrator, that's useful information to know to make sure that they don't accuse you of anything. I think that might be why they hired the private investigator. One of the reasons that really made me think this is that when the private investigator collected what he believed was evidence that the police had missed in their search, instead of turning it over to the police like any normal person would do, he tried to hold it for ransom, trying to get the police to agree to turn over their evidence and case files and photos in exchange for this evidence. Ultimately, he did not succeed with that because I believe that a court ordered that they needed to turn over the evidence they had collected, that they couldn't withhold it from the police, which I agree with. They shouldn't be able to hold it from the police. But the fact that they tried to use it as leverage to get access to the case file and thereby they held up the investigation at least a year. Like, what is really going on there? Like, that just doesn't make sense. I can understand maybe using it as leverage for a minute, but once you see it's not going to work, why would you hold up a case for a year when a murderer is walking loose? I just don't think that's legit. I also think that you can offer a $10 million reward for the capture of someone when you know that nobody is going to capture someone. If you know that you were the perpetrator, then you know you can offer a billion dollars and you'll never have to pay it out, so who cares? I think that that's possible. On the other hand, I also think it's possible that if not all the children were involved in the murder, I think it's very possible that some of the innocent ones were insistent on offering a reward, and the guilty ones wouldn't be able to refuse the idea without tipping their hand and showing that they actually had something to do with all this. So they may have been forced to go along with it just to save face or just to keep, keep themselves looking innocent. That's about what I think. I, I believe the most likely scenario involves one of their family members killing them. I think they had the most to gain. 